you are watching Co-op for Two. I'm Jesse Reichler, and this is the last of our many videos on Gumshoe. I did some full-length playthroughs, which were six or seven hours long the first three days. I did a long unboxing where we looked at all the components. I did a review, and then I did a more in-depth discussion of some of the mechanics. <clears throat> this is going to be the shortest video. This is a video for people who are considering playing Gumshoe or are about to start playing it. I'm just going to give you some quick thoughts on how I would approach playing it. First of all, um, you're going to have to get yourself a copy of Gumshoe. It is out of print. It's from 1985. There's a first edition and a second edition, and it's frequently on eBay. There's almost always a copy on eBay available. Try very hard to get the second edition. It's, it's a difficult enough game to play that you don't want to be going through the many, many pages of errata in the first edition. It's not an insignificant matter. There were a lot of errata in the first edition. So try hard to get the second edition. I'm not sure you can tell by the outside of the box, but on the first page of the clue book, it'll say second edition. And that's what you want. You want the second edition. Um, there is in if you watch the unboxing, you'll see a count of all the items in the box that you can make sure are available. Okay, so get yourself a second edition copy. Expect to pay somewhere between sixty and and one hundred and sixty dollars for it. Okay, that's the first thing. <clears throat> the second thing is, I would approach this game if and only if you are willing to completely embrace the bookkeeping, note-taking element of it. Treat it like you're a real detective and the quality of your notes are going to determine how well you do in this game. For me, I use these spiral-bound notebooks. I went through two of these. And for each day, for every clue, I wrote down the clue number and what inf relevant information I thought I learned. And then I kept track if there were branching frequently in this game, it'll say, do you want to do this, do this? I kept track of all the options and then which ones I visited. Each page has its own clue number, etc. This game, you're really going to have to keep track of that. And it's going to challenge your ability to do good bookkeeping because you'll be like, did we, did I, I went to this place and I went down this branch and then this sub branch, but did we do all those options? So keep good notes. Now, so those are the notes I took while playing the game. But then after every day was over, there are nine days, nine game days. After each day was over, I went to a Google Docs and I created a document where I wrote down my notes for the day. Now, look, here's my notes. I mean, don't look at this, but here's for day one. The different cases, the different evidence I found, different locations, the lab reports, what they had. I guess I shouldn't show you that. But basically, I ended up with a 25, 26 page document of my notes. And I just embraced that as a way to play the game. Like part of the fun of the game is writing up your notes and doing a good job of summarizing the information you found. Because there's an overwhelming amount of information over the course of nine days, all of these cases interleaving. If you don't do that, I think you're going to feel overwhelmed. Now, along those same lines, I very early on, after maybe the first day or second day, I decided, okay, even though this is an expensive out-of-print game, this is, one, this is something that I'm going to mark up. And that's what I did. Now, I mark up when I read a book, I'll write in the margin. So I'm the kind of person that likes to write on material as I read it. But that's what I did for this game. I marked every time I read a clue. I underlined parts of the clue that I thought were relevant. I marked every time I saw a fingerprint. I marked on the fingerprint that I had seen it so I would know when I saw it again. When I read the newspaper, if I saw something that I thought was relevant, I marked on that. So... If you think you can get by without doing that, or if you want to Xerox and write on that, that's up to you. But I would just say, like, I was all in. If, you, if you're going to spend $160 on a game, and you're going to spend 50 hours playing it, and it's an epic game that demands your full attention, 
and your full focus. I just said, I'm in for a penny and for a pound. I marked up on everything and that's how I would recommend. You can get, you can use pencils or erasable pens, but I would write on my stuff, but that's gonna be up to you. Um, and take notes, especially if you're playing multiple people uh, in a group, then having a summary document that you can look at at the beginning of every day is useful. And maybe that's a good segue to talk about how many people to play with. Now, you might go in the BGG forum section of Gumshoe. There's not much discussion of it because it's such a rare game, but there is some, and there are people who have played it with multiple players. I played it solo. Um, one or two players is the max for me. But I think this would be an interesting game to play with multiple players, but again, you're gonna to have to have a group with very like-minded people willing to, have, who have the stamina to play this for, for 45, 55, 65 hours. Um, and it's gonna to have to be the same group and you're gonna to have to play it in close succession. If you wait too long between games, you're gonna forget information. And the biggest challenge though that you're gonna have is figuring out how to deal with the time element of this game. And I don't have a perfect answer for you there. In this game, you start the day at say 9 a.m. and you're supposed to end the day at 10 p.m. and you've got this time sheet what, that you're supposed to keep track of what clue you went to and how time passed. Some clues you look up, m many of them say it took 15 minutes, sometimes it'll take half an hour. Sometimes you'll have an action like to follow someone or to stake out a place which could take up several hours of the day doing that. And if you're playing with multiple players, one person might do that, another person might do something else. There are certain actions that are gonna basically eat up an entire day, like certain paths that you'll follow, like staking out of a house or whatever, where you might end up spending most of the day in one little small element of that day's information. And you're gonna to have to decide what to do when you get to the end of that day. Everyone's in agreement that you're going to have to play through each day multiple times if you want to solve these cases. So you, you could play through the whole thing and not worry about the time element. But I think if you did that, you'd be missing out on some of the sort of the weightiness of some of the decisions like, should I do this? Should I do that? Well, if this takes up a lot of time, that's maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should do this thing that's more efficient. So the way I played it, was I played through every day, each, the first time, first playthrough of each day, I kept very detailed notes of um, the time it took me to do everything and when the day ended. And then I immediately replayed that day, doing things differently, going to the places I hadn't yet been to or going down different paths, different branching paths. And on my second playthrough, I was much more relaxed about the time element. I basically almost ignored the thing that said four hours passed or two hours passed. I just didn't worry about it. For me, that was the most enjoyable way to play it. But there is no perfectly satisfying way to play this game and handle the time. You could try if you didn't care so much about solving it, if you were in it more for the narrative and the experience, you could try playing each day once only and not replaying a day. You would, you would be missing out on huge chunks of the mystery though, and I think it would be unsatisfying. But there's also something unsatisfying about replaying a day and not worrying about the time. So there's, that's the, if there's one real flaw in this game, that's it. But I would encourage you to sort of treat it as, um, sort of appreciate the time mechanic without being strict about it. Like appreciate that some action happened that knocked you out for two days without feeling compelled to pay the price in game terms about <laughs> missing two days worth of information. But see how you feel about it. Play it and see how you feel about it. And you're gonna have to sort of ad lib it. Um, Okay, a little more mechanically. When I played it, and this is, I, I, this is how I appreciated it the most, um, 
I would go through the coup points for a day. And as I, I definitely don't go to coup points that you don't have justification for going to. So these are addresses for the most part. And you could just go to every place and read what it says without knowing why you're going there or what there is. You shouldn't do that. That's not satisfying. But what I did is I marked on the left-hand side of each clue point a little circle when I had a justification for going to a place. And then I tried to write down the thing next to it. Like if this was the address of someone's house, let's say the murder victim, um, I got his name, I looked him up in the phone book, I found his address, and I see his address on the coupons. points. I make a little mark next to it and write his name next to it. So as I was playing through the day, more and more of these coupons, points, I was filling in with uh, what, they, what this address was relevant to, what it referenced. And then I would go to a place once I got that. And so you might start off the day with like five coupons points that you know what they are, maybe another five that are for informants or locations like the DMV. And then when I would actually visit a place, I marked it on the right-hand side so I know, okay, I've been there, I don't have to go back there. And then as I visited those places, I would uncover more places and mark those. Then inevitably you'll get to the end of the day and there'll be certain addresses that you still haven't figured out what they're doing on this thing. What are they in reference to? What address is that? Is that how is that relevant to my case? Most of the time, there was a way to find that address. Occasionally you'll find an address that's on one day and it's also on the next day and it was just giving you that early even though you really had no reason to know about it yet. So what I would do is this. Uh, after I'd go to all the places that I knew how to find and they would unlock more places, I would end the day, I would get to the end of the day and have certain places that I didn't know why they were relevant. Then I would go to the, look at the next day and I would check out those places that I couldn't find were relevant. And I would say, is that same clue, is that address and the clue you're supposed to look up for that address the same on the next day? If they were, then I assumed, okay, I've got another day to find out why this is relevant and I just moved, I just left that alone. Occasionally I'll find an address that was missing on the next day or whose clue lookup changed. Those I felt much more compelled to figure out and read, figure out why they're relevant and visit them. So for those few, I would spend a little more time trying to figure out why, how I might, what, what lead did I not follow through? Did I not look up some place, some person's place of work? Should I have looked at? So I would spend another hour or so trying to find leads that would lead me to these locations. Again, these are only for the locations that are not available the next day. Then occasionally, not in the first couple of days, but occasionally I got to the point, maybe when I was wearing, getting a little worn out and didn't want to put in an extra three hours just to figure out one extra clue. Occasionally I would quickly peek at that clue. Again, this is after you've chased down everything else you can think of. Maybe taken a break, had some dinner, had a drink, come back to it. When you really can't figure out, I would occasionally look up a clue and just read the first sentence or two and try to see if it's some, if it's, if I could get an idea of what kind of thing it was that I should be looking for. Then when I looked at it, then I would go back and say, okay, I can see it. It's, I'm visiting some location. So let me think, how could I have gotten to that location? So when at all possible, try to give yourself just enough information that you could go look up why you should be visiting that place. Okay. I also kept track of each location when there was branching and what the different branch clue numbers were so that I could keep track. Again, this is a, this is a note keeping task that you, when you play this game. Um, but I would keep track of which branches and then underline them when I visited them. Now, the other thing is when I started a new day, I would come back and look at this new day and I would, the first thing I started before I played any of the new day is I would go and look for each address, they're alphabetical, which addresses were from, were also found on the previous day. And I would write in their margin what that, what those addresses are. So that when I'd start a day, all of the addresses I knew about from the previous day would be marked. I could see why they were relevant. And then I would look at all the numbers for all of these addresses and see if they had changed. 
If a number hadn't changed, if the clue lookup for an address hadn't changed, I know that's just the same clue is available on multiple days to give you more shots at visiting that place. So I'd mark those on the right hand side with a little dot saying that I had basically already visited that clue. As you go on in days, you'll find that by the time you get to the third or fourth day, half your locations you've already been to. You don't have to focus on those, just the new locations. So that cut your work down quite a bit. Again, there's a lot to do in this game. It's kind of overwhelming. Anything you can do to help you focus on things and weed out wasted time, I recommend. All right, let's see, what else did we do? Um, in the same vein, I already said that when I found a fingerprint, I marked I marked that it had been found. I put in, in my notes, in computer searchable notes, I put every fingerprint and what type it was and where it was found. But um, every time you see a fingerprint in this game, you can look it up. It's on one of these cards. So there's lots of fingerprints in this clue book. There's never a fingerprint that isn't on one of these index cards. Now it might not be on a mugshot. They might not be look. It might not be in the DMV, but you can always translate the picture of a fingerprint into a number on these cards. So every time I found a fingerprint on a card, I marked it on the card so that if I came back and found a new fingerprint, I would know, hey, I've seen that fingerprint before. I would recommend that. I would also recommend in your notes that you keep track of the fingerprint number and the type because it'll be useful if you come across a mugshot and you know this guy's all his fingerprints are W5s, World 5s, so you'll know, well, let me see if I've seen that fingerprint before. You can look up in your notes all the W5s and see if any of them match his fingerprints or the fingerprints from an autopsy. Um, okay, what else? Um, the questions at the end of the day. There are nine days. At the end of each day, the old man at the detective agency has some questions for you in this book. Here are the questions for the nine days. I would recommend you look up the questions after you play the day. It's not gonna hurt you to look up the questions, but don't try to answer them and obviously don't look up the answers. Don't look them up until all, you could look it up when you're sure you know the solution, but I just didn't look up any of the answers. I didn't try to answer anything until the ninth day. So I played the entire case. I wrote down my theories in my notes as I was going through, but I didn't try to answer any questions till the final day. Now, it's not that important. You could you have a pretty good idea when you've solved a case and when you could try to answer it. So if you feel like but don't, don't, obviously you don't try to answer on your first, in your first glimpse of the solution, but after a day or so passes and no more information is coming out about the case, you could try to answer it. But if you're me, write your notes, answer them all at the end. Um, let's see, mugshots. It's a little difficult to know how to advise you about when to do an exhaustive search for mugshots. But what I would say is, occasionally when you get to a dead end on a case, when you're not getting, when you're not developing more leads and, and elaborating a case, go through the mugshots. Go through the backs occasionally to look at at um, aliases and nicknames. You may find some of them turn up in your case. You might go and look at the what their arrest record is for. That might give you some information. And occasionally, you might want to go through the trouble of correlating someone's fingerprints. Now, there are too many to do this for every fingerprint. You know, Every time you find a fingerprint, you're not going to look up whose mugshot it is because much of the time they're not going to have a mugshot because they weren't previously arrested. But occasionally they will. And what I would say to you is when you, when you reach a dead end of a case, before you try to solve it and say, well, a mystery person, I understand the case, but I don't know who the, what their name is, spend a little bit of time trying to find them in the mugshots and you'll be able to narrow that down in this way. Let's say you've found a fingerprint that you know was a killer, right? You know his fingerprint is fingerprint, let's say it was fingerprint, it was W2, 
Let me find a better one. Okay, let's say you know it's 1201. You've matched that fingerprint, you found it at the crime scene, you know it's 1201. You can't find his fingerprint in the DMV, so you don't know who this is, but you know it's a W3 whirl, right? And you, you'll get so you understand what a W3 whirl looks like at a glance. So now what you could do is when you, after, after you use your normal leads to trace down who that might be and you can't find a name to that, maybe go through your mug shots and do something like this. You say, well, I know it's gotta be a male, so here are my male mug shots. I know he's a white male, so okay, here are my 10 white male mug shots, but it's gonna be more like 15, okay. And now what you can do is, each of the mug shots for a person will have the same fingerprint type. And at a glance, you'll be able to identify the four or so that are W3 whirls. So you'll be able to narrow it down to three potential mug shots that have this kind of fingerprint. And then for that, you'll have to look for each of these five finger fingers for each of these people. Do, do any of those five match that 1201 that you looked up? So it's a little bit of brute force, but if you do your fingerprint matching properly, you'll be able to narrow it down to a reasonable number to brute force check. And I would say like, you're never gonna need to do that early, but maybe late in the case after you've run out of leads, spend some time doing that. Don't give up and say it was a John Doe. Spend a little bit of time doing that. Um, let's see, what else would I recommend? Um, I guess the last thing I would recommend is maybe just stopping by the BGG forum. There's one nice thread, I forget who started it, but there's one nice thread on sort of what I wish I knew or getting started with Gumshoe. Just some suggestions from various people who have played it. And it's got a couple of errata, they're not very important. But give that a look. And um, yeah, I think that's enough to get you started, but be, the best advice I can give you is prepare for a long haul. <laughs> um, embrace the note taking and the sort of grunt shoe leather work of tracking down leads and try to handle the time stuff in the way that is most enjoyable for you. And mark up your leads, Keep, take very, if you have to, Someone said they Xerox these, so maybe you could Xerox the front sheets of these if you don't want to write in this book. And I'd love to hear how you get on with Gumshoe. It's going to be a challenge to play, but and I suggest you try to play the days in close succession. But if you like this kind of thing, if it appeals to you, then I think it's worth giving a try. And um, I'll see you on the channel. Bye.